change the tempo a little bit and we're going to sing what number was that? 422? 422 one that we all know I hope we are marching to Zion and we're going to be a little more lively. opening song, number 497, Standing on a Purpose True, number 497. Would you please stand? That's the wrong number. I see. Let's see if we can find it real quick. Five eighteen. Is that what you said, Connie? Five 
518. So that's a misprint. Number 518. person in the bulletin. My name is Lorna Lawrence, but I'm reading the scripture this evening and uh, will remain standing for the scripture and then for prayer. The scripture is from Philippians 3, verse 8 to 11. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Please bow your heads for prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, we have entered your presence to worship and praise you as we enter upon the sacred hours of the Sabbath, a day of rest and gladness, a day of joy and light. We have traveled from various locations and distances to be here, Father, for your protective hand and watchful eye of safety, we give you thanks. Father, for the blessing of a measure of health, may be just enough to bring us here. For this, we also give you thanks. Lord, we intercede on behalf of this college. May your grace and mercy 
hover over this institution, presiding over all its decisions and activities. And we pray that its growth and influence will be as wells of waters springing up into everlasting life to thousands coming down the corridors of time. Father, you have assigned to us a messenger to this gathering, and with him, your accompanying message. All your biddings are enablings, Lord. So may your spirit rest upon him and abide in him as he speaks to us, and the glory will be yours. We thank you, Father, for inclining your ears to us through the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.
Thank you very much for this wonderful musical performance. Paul White on the piano, Bob Wilson on the organ. And thank Beverly Burton and Ralph Dawkins for the song service. Patricia Clark for praying and our dear friend for the scripture reading. So we off to a very good start. Now, we're ready for a devotional message which will be brought to us by Pastor Ron Nickerson. Pastor Nickerson is a member of our executive committee, very dedicated evangelist. And so the message today, this evening, will be very meaningful. At this time, let us give him our undivided attention. His bio is written in the bulletin. Pastor. Let's bow our heads one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray for the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds. We ask this through Jesus Christ. Amen. Resilience in the face of adversity. Now that's a term that could be used especially in New England. There's nothing like New England to understand adversity. So I have two stories for you tonight. The first one starts with a young man, 37 years old, just being elected as our third general conference president, John Nevin Andrews. He lived just less than two miles from here. And when he was elected president of the general conference, he decided he was going to travel around a bit. And he started in the little church of Washington, New Hampshire. Now, when he got there, he discovered something rather depressing. And that was, they were most of the time not even meeting. The place was in disrepair and the congregation had kind of just fallen to the side. Now he could have just said, like some would say, well, let's just close it down and not worry about it. One of the reasons that we incorporated at the church was so that we could actually own property. Before that, at the church, we could not own property. We had to incorporate. So they could have done that. But instead of doing that, he decided to call his old friends. And that was James and Ellen White. Now, you may be surprised to hear that the cell tires weren't working back then. And communication was a little slower than it is today. Not only was communication slower, but for them to catch the next flight to Boston just didn't happen. So there was going to be a long delay, and likewise they could say the same thing. Well, we'll come next summer, and we'll deal with it in the summer. But resilience in the face of adversity means that you do what needs to be done now. You know, it's a sad thing. At my age, I realize that I'm destined to dreams because the young men have the visions. Well, that means that most of us older folks are asleep more than they are. And I think that is a lot of times true. So he called them and they decided they would come out. 1867. They were going to arrive in December. Now this is the fourth coldest recorded year in history. 1867. How many have been to the Washington church? How many have been there in December? No? Why not? Because it's so cold. When I was pastoring there, we used to close it down the 1st of November and meet in town until May 1st. Because it was too cold. But I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Cold is a state of mind. Don't let anyone else know that. I know that because many years ago I was stranded with my crew of four in the Aleutian Islands for a week without food and water at 75 below zero. And I discovered cold is a state of mind. You can endure an awful lot if you really want to. And I wanted to. So they arrived in December. They were going to have an evangelistic meeting. Try to rally the troops. Bring everybody together. 
Now there was the one leader that was there, his name was William Farnsworth. And he was recorded as probably the first Seventh-day Adventist on record. William Farnsworth. Now his son was just 19 years old, Eugene Farnsworth. And Eugene was facing what many young people are facing today. They didn't want anything to do with the church. Why? One of the reasons is they see oftentimes us as adults saying one thing and doing something different. He saw this with his father. William Farnworth had a bad habit, chewing tobacco. And he tried to cover it as much as possible. No one in the church knew that he did this, but Eugene did. Eugene did. And so when they came and they preached for six hours, he said, if she really is a prophet, then she'll say something to my father. And after they had preached a while, she started to talk to different people in the congregation and tell them things about themselves that they needed to change. Things that no one else could know. And as she went down the aisle, she came to Williams Farnsworth. And she told him about his habit that he had to give up. Right then, his son knew that she was a prophet. And so, the young people started to listen. And on Christmas Day, they asked to be baptized. And like any good pastor probably would have said, great, in the spring or in the summer, but I baptized somebody in the spring at Millen Pond and it's still pretty cold. In the spring or in the summer, we'll arrange to have the baptism. Now there were 13 young people, 12 of them were baptized. I don't know who did the baptizing, but I, hopefully they alternated pastors because they cut two feet whole of ice to make way to baptize these young people. Resilience in the face of adversity. How resilient would you be with your faith? Story number one. Story number two. It was the early 1970s. <clears throat> I was stationed on a ship out of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And we were in port only three days a month. So we were continually underway. We had just been alongside a Russian fishing trawler for talks with the Russians. We would spent two weeks babysitting the dignitaries. And then we were going to be relieved by another ship. As we went back to Portsmouth, they told us we had to be on two-hour recall. Now what that means is from the time they call you, you have to be back to the ship within two hours. Now I was the crypto specialist. That means I was the person that handled all of the secret communications. And they would not sail without me. Now my family lived in Lancaster, right here. And so I figured out what can I do? Well, I could get from Lancaster to Portsmouth in two hours. That's not a major problem. So I figured there wouldn't be any trouble if we went to Lancaster and visited my mother and father-in-law. So we loaded up the kids and we headed out towards Lancaster. Now there's one minor problem. If the recall happens when I leave the ship and I get to Lancaster, I may only have 45 minutes to get back. So I just assumed that that wouldn't happen. Well, when we arrived in Lancaster, my mother-in-law was on the front porch. They were excited to see us, and she said, oh, by the way, your ship called. And I said, when? About an hour ago. And they said that you had to get underway. So I jumped back in the car, and I made it from Lancaster to Portsmouth, New well, actually Newcastle, in 45 minutes. And as I got to the ship, the ship was running 
All the lines were released except one, and the captain said, leave the car running and jump on board. So I did what he said. I jumped on board and we headed for Martha's Vineyard. Now to get to Martha's Vineyard, the easiest way is to go through the Cape Cod Canal. And so they cleared the Cape Cod Canal so we could go through with a 210 foot cutter at full speed. And as we made our way there, I made my way to the communications room because that's where I was supposed to be. And I started to uncover what was happening. The ship that relieved us was named the Vigilant. And on that Russian trawler, there was a man who was their, my counterpart, their radio operator. And he had become a Christian. Now that was not something that was allowable in Russia at that time. And so he had plotted and thought of what can he do to get to America where he thought he could be free and that he could worship God. His name was Simus Kaderka. And when our ship left, he realized his chances were nil of ever getting to America. They were five miles offshore of Martha's Vineyard, which is well inside U.S. territorial waters. But he didn't have any way to cover that five miles. And the more he looked at that ship tied up alongside, the more he thought about jumping to their flight deck. Now, a 210-foot cutter has a helo deck on the back, and the helicopter wasn't there, so it's just a big open area. And their main communications is a wire that runs from the top of the mast back to what they call the fantail, which is the very back of the ship. The ship they were alongside, the Russian trawler, was 10 stories high. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a ship 10 stories high and six to 700 feet long. Uh, six to 700 yards long, excuse me. Several football fields. And it was a monstrosity. Now his port was about two stories up and he had a little deck that he could go out to and see the ship. And the more he thought about it, the more he realized this would be his only chance. He would be saying goodbye to all his family. He would say goodbye to everything, but he would be able to worship God, something that he has wanted to do for some time. And so, as he watched the things going on, he just made a split-second decision. He jumped to the deck of the Coast Guard ship. Now, when he jumped to the deck of the Coast Guard ship, he landed, and it was a good story and a half down and so he hurt himself a little bit but he was on American soil he would be safe immediately the crewmen grabbed him and brought him in to the captain and they called the wardroom and in the meantime the captain ordered that they get underway immediately and as they did their rigging caught on that fishing trawler and ripped and broke their communications equipment. So they had to do everything over open airwaves. Now, cryptographics is pretty interesting. You can talk and all you would hear is static, unless you had the right equipment at the other end that translated it. And so now I'm listening to what's going on over the open airwaves, which means everybody can know what's going on. It was a very distressing situation for the captain of that ship. This was his first command. He didn't want to make any mistakes. And so he pulled away quickly. And as quickly as they pulled away, the Russians realized what had happened. Now, it wasn't just anybody that jumped to that ship. This was the crypto specialist. This was the guy that had all of the information about their codes and their messages. So they did not want to let him go. They immediately demanded that they return him 
to their ship. Resilience in the face of adversity. How resilient would your faith be at that time? As he's talking to the captain in the wardroom, the captain doesn't want to make a bad decision. Now, those that have been in the military, especially those that have been in the Navy, know that the captain of a ship is the authority. On scene, on a situation, he almost cannot make a wrong decision except making no decision. And so he did what he thought would be a convenient thing. And I'm listening to all of this on, on the radio as we're steaming there as fast as we can. He calls Boston, the command headquarters for the 1st Coast Guard District. The Admiral in Boston is on sick leave. And so his second in command, who's another captain, also doesn't want to make the wrong decision because he wants to make Admiral. And so he wonders, what am I going to tell him to do? The captain says, what do I do? What do I do with this fellow that just jumped onto our ship and we've already determined who he is? The captain in Boston said, well, wait, I'll call Washington. Now this is the weekend. Who's in Washington on the weekend? Nobody. Except the undersecretary to the undersecretary to the undersecretary of the cleaning man. There's nobody there. So they get a hold of somebody who is supposedly in control, a politician. And he says, give them back. Sent the word back to Boston. Boston calls back to the ship. He says, give them back. And the captain of the ship says, how? How do I give somebody back? Well, the guy in Boston calls back Washington and he said, how? How do we do this diplomatically without causing some trouble? Because by all rights, according to our own laws, if he is on our soil and is asking for asylum, and we have a pretty good idea that he would be hurt if we give him back, we're supposed to do it. So he says, well, just throw him in the water and let them pick him up. And he said, with the Coast Guard, we can't do that. So they said, well, we don't care how you do it, but we don't want you to mess up the negotiations that we have going on. So you're going to give them back one way or another. So he called back, and now finally the captain of the ship is starting to see that he's in a no-win situation. So he tells the Boston that he can't do that. So I'm going to let them come and get him. Now, this is even worse. The Russians send Every Russian ship has a detachment of KGB. This was their control force. They sent an armed detachment to a U.S. military vessel to forcibly remove somebody. Now that's an act of war. But the captain said, let them come aboard. When they came aboard, young Samus Kadurka is in the wardroom and he is just elated that he is finally going to be free. And as they come to the door, you can know that he knew every KGB officer on that ship. And when he saw them show up with their guns drawn, he was devastated. Now there was a hole in the ship, they call it a hatch, on that deck. And that dropped down to the next deck down. Now the doors were open, but the hatch took you down a deck which means you can get away quicker. So he saw that hole and he jumped down onto the deck below and he ran to the back of the ship. The captain immediately, in a panic, told him to get the ship underway. Now a 210 foot cutter can turn at full speed in its own length. It can get up to full speed in about twice its own length. The bow rises right out of the water and those engines just push that thing right forward like a speedboat. And that's what happened. And the Simon Kudurka got to the back of the ship and he's 
He's going to jump over the back. He said, I don't care if it's five miles, I'll swim. He's going to jump over the back, and at this point, he can't think of an English word because he's screaming in Russian. The crewmen grab him because if he jumped over that side, instantly he would be chewed up by the propellers. So they're holding him, figuring they're saving his life when the Russians show up with their weapons. And the captain comes over to loudspeaker and he says, nobody interfere or they will suffer court-martial. Let the Russians take control. Right about that time, we're just coming into view. And they grabbed Simus Kadurka and they beat him unconscious in front of the crew. And as they dragged him away down the deck. Now another thing you may not be aware of is that the deck of a Navy or a Coast Guard vessel is covered with a material called non-skid. It's like coarse sandpaper so that you don't slip. So when they dragged him down to their boat, he left half of him behind. I mean, it just left a trail of blood. And they threw him down onto the boat. We got there as we're pulling him up alongside. They were just getting back to the Russian ship and they had thrown down a rope, tied it to his feet, and they were hauling him aboard upside down. That was the closest I ever got to Simon Skaderka, was to watch him being hauled aboard upside down. And then everything fell apart. There was a huge, huge uprise among the Lithuanian population in the U.S. about what had happened, because this boy was a Lithuanian. And it took three years for Henry Kissinger to arrange for his release, but they finally released him. The reason they could do that was because they discovered that the reason he wanted to be a Christian was because he had an American mother. And not only had she taught him about the Bible, but because his mother was an American, he was technically eligible for American citizenship. It couldn't have gotten any worse. They sent him for three years to Siberia. Now, I know I said cold is a state of mind, but that doesn't mean it has to be a good mind. Cold is bad. And after three years in Siberia, every one of the crew was transferred off of that ship. We received one of the men on our ship, and he was so, it was one of the men that was on the fantail of that boat when he, they held on to him. The trauma was so much for him that he committed suicide about six months later. He couldn't live with himself. And after three years, the commanding officer of that ship was transferred to base New York, which was not exactly a promotion. And Henry Kissinger arranged for Simus Kadurka to be returned through New York. And somebody in Washington thought it would be a great idea if the Coast Guard were there to meet him when they got off the plane. Nobody took the time to figure out that the captain of the base was the man that sent him back to the ship. And so it was that captain that met him when he got off the plane. You tried to do all this because you had faith. Resilience in the face of adversity. How much adversity can you take? And when he came to that gangway to get off of that plane, the first man you meet is the man that put you in Siberia. What would you do? How would you face that? I wasn't there, but I was told that Simus Kadurka never let go of his religion. Our scripture lesson is about righteousness by faith in Christ alone. And it was something that he held dearly. He turned to the captain and he stuck his hand out and he said, my God says that I must bless you.
and forgive you. Could you have done that? Three years in Siberia, beaten, almost unconscious, or who had to have been unconscious, and he still could stand there and say, my God tells me that I not only forgive you, but I'm to bless you. That is resilience in the face of adversity. We see adversity all the time. And our adversity isn't the same as everybody's adversity. But our resilience can be the same. We can make sure that God is always in control. I want to turn to that scripture lesson reading. Philippians 3. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Can you say that? Can we say that? For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the righteousness resurrection from the dead. Righteousness by faith, in Jesus Christ. It should be our motto. It should be something that we are screaming from the mountaintops. It should be something that we are preaching about in every pulpit. Spirit of Prophecy says that we should be preaching Jesus Christ in every sermon that we do. I pray that as we enjoy old friendships, and as we take this weekend back with us, that we remember exactly what resilience in the face of adversity is. Our closing hymn is number 588. I hope that's 588. 544. 544. Hmm? It's 524. 524. 524. That's understandable because I have four churches and I generally speak at two each week and I never use the same sermon twice. And oftentimes, several times, I leave the first church with my notes behind and I get there without anything. So adversity happens. 524, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus.
that stands for the last verse. trust in God. Thank you Pastor Ron Nickerson for this wonderful message and to see how it is when we really trust in God and work together. After the benediction there will be a reception downstairs so everyone is welcome and shortly after that in the youth chapel we'll be having Singspiration by Beverly Burton and company. And then tomorrow should be a wonderful day. We'll have more wonderful music by Paul White and Bob Wilson. So let us enjoy the weekend and let us give God thanks. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank thee for thy many blessings. We thank thee for bringing us here together as we worship thee and fellowship with thee. Bless all the alumni. Bless all our friends and relatives who are here. Bless the faculty, bless the president of the institution, former president, alumni, executive committee, board members, all of us who are here. Bless the children and help us to have a vision of hope as we continue to grow and follow our theme says, resilience in a time of adversity. We pray that it will help us to live for thee, forgive us from our sins, and keep us true to thee for Jesus' sake.